This is Dummy World. You're sounding better, more relaxed. Yeah, I am. I am. I'm less sweaty. <laughs> Calming down a little bit. <laughs> Tech issues. No. Why will my fucking microphone work? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So should we begin? Yeah, let's begin. All right. So this is Demi World. I'm Cindy. I'm Kelly. And what are we talking about today? Oh, uh, historic urban legends. Correct. I'm really excited to hear about yours. I know nothing about it. I yeah. know that you, you mentioned you watched a really long documentary or something on it, and I'm, like, super excited. And I didn't even tell you what the documentary was on. No, you didn't. I know nothing. You know nothing. You know um, nothing. So my – what are we doing again? Her historical or – my historical <laughs> urban legend is the myth of the West, of the American West. Okay, I don't even know what that means exactly. Or we can call it the myth of the frontier west. So let's just okay. let's just start with that. The myth okay. of the American frontier. Okay. Why do you think that would be a myth? Um, well, let's see. There was Cuz front cuz there are already people maybe living on the land. <laughs> well, that's part of it, and I think there was a lot of stereotypes and uh, flashy stuff that was perpetuated by wild west shows exactly so yeah. that's like that's what the myth of the west is so okay we'll okay, start cool. we'll start early so the documentary I, I watched um was a pbs documentary from 1996 called the west it's okay. like a eight-part series and their each episode is 90 minutes long and so it starts um Well, first, let's start what America is. At that point in time, like, America was just 13 colonies. Right, and all on the East Coast, and the rest of it was unexplored by white people for the most part. Right, but there was all, but there's um, native tribes living all all through the land, and actually since, like, 1500s Spaniards have been coming up through Mexico and coming up through Texas and so there was a lot of the um, of the west quote unquote and when I say west probably west of the Mississippi that had already been explored that had already been settled um, that already had people living there whether they were native or not native and so the myth of the American west is especially like starting at the gold rush, but kind of, you know, before that in the early 1800s, when the American colonies started to expand West. And that's Mm -hmm. how they ended up with Texas, because Texas was actually part of Mexico at that time. And as we know, Mexico was, had been um, colonized by Spain. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so actually my understanding was that, Mexico had gained its freedom from Spain. and But they were worried about these large pieces of uninhabited land that they had that, that would be able to be taken back by Spain if they came to challenge their independence and start a war. So Mexico um, gave a bunch of Americans from the colonies an opportunity to come and like kind of live in Texas just so that the land was occupied and it would be harder for Spaniards to come and take it over. But what okay. But when in the true American fashion, the Americans were like, oh, this is great. We're just gonna go ahead and take Texas, Mexico. So sorry that you thought that we would help you with the Spaniards because this is our land now. Bye. And so because like when that happens, the the further that the Americans start to push west it starts to push the native tribes on to each other and their territories right. um, are getting smaller and smaller and so you know there's a lot of tribes living in the country and some were peaceful and some were not some were like war tribes and mm-hmm. they were always kind of fighting for like land from other tribes before the americans got involved but the more further out west the Americans pushed, it kind of pushed all the tribes into each other. And so there was a lot of lot of, of warfare. 
Right. There was a lot of strife internally between the tribes. Right. And because, especially because their territory kept getting smaller and smaller. So yeah. then, you know, you think of like frontier times and, and covered wagons. And so like really, I think kind of one of the definitions of frontier is pushing into a like a area that has not been discovered before. But that's that is actually bullshit because we know that people have been living in America for a really long time, not just the natives, but Mexico and Spaniards as well. Mm-hmm. So like this idea of Americans in covered wagons, like going west and exploring new territory, that itself is a myth because we already knew what was there. We were just really taking it over, pushing west. And then in 1848, they found gold in California. And while yeehaw, that was just an open invitation for the colonies to push all the way to the Pacific Ocean and claim all of the land that we have now as ours. And so that's really like the big myth of the West is that Americans were able to escape the colonies and be free and find riches and find land and find a happy life for themselves. But it really was just bullshit. I mean, it it is definitely been perpetuated by Hollywood, but at that time you had these archetypes in American history that were just that, they're archetypes. Um so there's a lot of scholars who do this. Um so this a scholar named Ken Kent Stockmesser identified four archetype heroes each personifying an era in the frontier. So we have the trapper Kit Carson and that um, he really is like when in 1848, 1849, when the gold rush hit and all of these people from the eastern seaboard were pushing their way to California. Um, I even think that like they wrote all of these books and like dime like novels on Kit Carson and all these things that he did that weren't even true and they would do things like name um, waterways after him so that people who were coming from the east going to California would take choose to take that waterway because it was named after Kit Carson and it was a was wa- there an advantage to taking the waterway well no, it was just, it was the people who had named it. They would ferry, mm-hmm. they would ferry these people, these oh, I see. across. And so they would name it like the Kit Carson Waterway, the Kit Carson Ferry, Com- let us ferry you across whatever Missouri River, whatever it is. And pe- ah, pe- early marketing right there. Early marketing. And people would take that ferry's company because it was, oh, it's named after Kit Carson. So it must be like really good. <laughs> Um, And another archetype is the outlaw Billy the Kid. Right. We have gunfighter Wild Bill Hickok Mm -hmm. and the soldier George Armstrong Custer. And each of these legends contain specific characteristics like genteel qualities, clever traits, prowessness, and an epic significance in American history. So another scholar, I think he's actually the premier scholar of the American West. His name is Richard Slotkin. He's a cultural critic and historian, a professor of English and American studies at Wesleyan University. So there is a a book that he has a couple chapters in. The book is called The Wiley Blackwell Encyclopedia of Race, Ethnicity, and Nationalism. And so the abstract of his chapters, Richard Slotkin's in the books, is the myth of the frontier is the oldest American national myth. Like all nation-state mythologies, its function is to provide a historical account and an ideological justification of national development and a repertoire of of exemplary fables based on historical events which offer plausible precedents for dealing with contemporary crises. The myth recognizes that the United States developed as a settler state, which grew geographically and increased in political and economic power by advancing European settlements into the territory of Native Americans and, quote, the wilderness. It builds upon that historical basis, a set of historical fables that explain and justify the development of American nationality as a product of this perennial advance into the wilderness or, quote, the virgin land 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, if white people aren't there, then it's not settled. Exactly. So frontier refers to uncharted territory, which is a land that hasn't been mapped, but that is not at all true. That's, I think, just part of the myth of the European colonies moving west and their justification for taking the land. Well, if you humanized the people that were living there before you got there, you would have a hard time justifying taking their land. Right. So, so by making them less than, it's easier to take their land. They're not really people. They're savages. Um, so Christine Bold, another scholar, she builds upon Slotkin's work of the myth of American West. And she argues that the myth of the West was created by what she calls the Frontier Club, which was a bunch of white Ivy Leaguers who hunted out West. Always. It always comes back to those rich white assholes. Ivy Leaguers. Every single time. Yep. She Damn. wrote she wrote about she writes about how they use their wealth and their status to silence the voices of African Americans, Native Americans, immigrants, and non elite white men. Ugh. The common myth of the frontier um to follow this period features the white cowboy riding in to save the white town folk, particularly women from Native Americans or Hispanic people. White women have been a huge pawn in history, especially like just visually. Right. Like, oh, a white woman. Oh, we must save the white woman. It's like, oh, man. Well, and another way that white women, I think, were used as pawns and that perpetuate this myth is as soon as as Europeans started advancing to the West to get to California for the gold rush, as soon as towns start popping up across the West, uh, brothels move in, really. Or, oh, absolutely, yeah. Or prostitutes come in um, and set up shop there. I don't know if you would even, it's so early, I don't know if you would really call them brothels. It's just kind of camps of prostitutes would come in. Mm-hmm. And so what we think about, like, these Western prostitutes is what we get from images from Hollywood in the movies is they're in, like, saloons. They're wearing bright, beautiful, colorful clothes. Like, everyone's playing the piano and they're running around. When the re- Somebody's playing poker. Exactly. And the okay. reality is, is that the prostitutes weren't wearing those kind of clothes. Most of them were addicted to drugs or alcohol because it was a very difficult lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Every client that they saw was likely to be very violent with them. And most of them were either killed or they killed themselves because it was such a difficult life. Yeah, and not to mention the disease. Oh, absolutely. There's there's just so many sexually transmitted diseases just running rampant. And lots, lots of babies that were unwanted. And oh, man, that does sound rough. Yep, so um, what's interesting, too, about, well, I mean, this is a lot of it's from the documentary I saw, is when you actually get to California and in the gold rush, you have, like, all these white Europeans that came from the colonies. And then another large group of people that came were Chinese that came across the Pacific Ocean and came to California for the gold rush. And, Mm -hmm. of course, because, like, the white Europeans were powerful and just dicks, as we all know, um, they would claim the best, um, I guess, claims. claims, Best claims, yeah. Best claims for themselves. And they would even, like, take claims from Chinese immigrants and stuff and take them for their own. And so the Chinese people would work these really kind of shitty pieces of land. Right. But they would end up actually becoming much more wealthy and making a lot more money than the white your americans um because at this point california wasn't part wasn't an american territory yet or anything these are all people coming from the colonies so Mm -hmm. um the chinese people would they were really efficient in how they worked they um and they were really serious about their business whereas like the American men, a lot of times they didn't work on Sunday and they claimed it was because, you know, Jesus's day, but God's day, whatever. That's bullshit. Just being lazy. But they would ruin themselves with drinking and gambling and whoring around and they weren't working effectively and they were kind of spending all of their money by living this wild partying lifestyle. Well, yeah, it's kind of like as soon as they find a little bit of gold dust, they go and cash it in and then drink it all and then go do it again. 
Exactly. Yeah. But yet somehow, I probably by sheer numbers and, of course, like the Calvary and whatever else. And then after the Civil War, you know, we just kept expanding further and further west. We just, I think, threw a lot of violence and arms and sheer numbers of people were able to take over the country that we now know as America. Yeah. Manifest destiny. Right. I mean, that's part of that, you know, that's definitely perpetuated as part of the myth that we were supposed to take over this land. It is the white European man's destiny in life. God wants us to have this land. Yeah. God, it's so depressing when you think about it that way. It kind of takes all the romance out of the sails, doesn't it? <laughs> right. And so... And so you have, like like you said, in, in books and then what we know later from movies, but that all kind of comes from books. It's just perpetuating these stories that make it ideal for people to come out west. And so if people, I think, in the colonies knew how hard life really was out west, maybe a lot of them wouldn't have gone. But because they're reading these stories about an ideal life, they want to have take their shot at it. So like when I think about the expansion West and I um, like the, the Western novels and things that were written about it to entice people to come out, it's not because that's how life was. It's because that's how they wanted life to be. Right. And so what I have learned um, in my profession just through classes that I've taken is Hollywood. So Hollywood we know like the studios were all started by Jewish men and they it was a very Jewish people have always had a very hard life um, when they came to America and living in in New York City in the tenements it was very very difficult life but you know before that it's always been very difficult for Jewish people in the world and yeah, they're the scapegoats of everything. Of everything. And so yeah. when they start making movies, they're making the life that they want. It's not that they're making life to reflect how their life is. They're making movies to reflect how they want life to be. And that, fairy tale. A fairy tale. And so people then, the masses who consume this kind of thing, start to think that that's actually how life is. And that's how it is with the West when you have these Western dime novels and these stories about Kit Carson and all the things he did. In fact, the documentary said, a historian said that um, when people would ask, Kit, meet Kit Carson in person, because uh, I believe he ended up settling in Wyoming or Idaho, somewhere out West, but um, people would ask him about these stories that they had read about him and these books <laughs> that and he and he would say something like god that's a really good story I just you know or he, people ask him if it was true oh is it true that you did this or is it true that you did that and he'd be like it's possible I just don't remember <laughs> you know it could have happened I may have not been there, but it could have happened. No, it, yeah, I mean, it could have happened. It's just I'm not sure. recalling at the moment. Yeah, that's so funny. When I was uh, in college, I took a U.S. history class that focused on women in the United States. So we looked at, like, Southern women during the antebellum, you know, slavery and everything. We looked at frontier women. We looked at Native women. We looked at slave women. And it was like one of the most enlightening classes I've ever taken because they women get traditionally just written out of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And this narrative was all about them and about how hard it was on the frontier. So you're out there, you're with your husband, there's nobody else around for miles and miles and miles. You're going to have to deliver your baby all by yourself. You have never done this before. And then, you know, if you live through delivering your baby on your own, you're going to get pregnant right away again. Right. So all of a sudden you have like seven kids and, you know, you've got open fires because that's how, you know, your hearth is and everything. you got a dirt floor. You might have a table that you can tie your little toddlers to so they don't fall into the fire. It's just, you know what I mean? It's just yeah, the isolation 
was so great and the work was so hard that, you know, women would work in the fields too, but they also like have to like work the house. Right. And the men didn't do that part of it. So women had twice as much work as the men did. And we still do. Right. We still do. But at least we have running water now and flushing toilets. <laughs> Is it um, the third Back to the Future where they go to the Old West? Old West. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Li- life isn't like that, folks. No. Mm-mm. <laughs> There's no fringe. I'm sorry. We didn't have fringe. <laughs> Nobody had teeth. And you Alcohol know, made you blind. I want... Laud- laudanum was a thing. People drank cocaine. Like, I mean, it was it was hard. It was hardcore. I went to high school in a town that was a mining town. Um, and it's, it's still historically a mining town that most of the buildings are historical. And, you know, it was they had three churches and like 45 saloons back in the day. And they would advertise jobs for women to come and work in the schools that they were setting up in town Mm -hmm. and so these women from the colonies from the east coast would come to this little mining town um expecting to set up a school but there would be no school and so they would have no choice but to be a prostitute and that's how most like a lot of the prostitutes got to that area because of things like that well, there was this idea that by importing women, by whatever means necessary, uh, shady, they're not shady, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, that they would somehow tame these cowboys. They would tame these frontier men into being respectable people. And all it did was get these women raped, right, and force them into sex, you know, sex, sex slavery. Work. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm-hmm. It's just. Yeah, it happened a lot in California, too, because it was, like, the last frontier. Well, and I think, you know, Billy the Kid is kind of, he has this, people think of him of, like, um, sort of like a Robin Hood type figure or something like that. And then it's always, like, the us and them with the West. It's, like, cowboys and Indians and outlaws and gunfighters and and order and disorder. And and I would just go ahead and say it, it was mostly just disorder. Oh, it was absolute chaos. There was no law. Like, if you had a sheriff, they may not live locally. You know, then there was the, uh, what are the guys in Texas? The uh, the Texas Rangers. The Rangers, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then there was the other guys that did a lot of stuff with uh, train robberies. Uh, it was like a family. I can't remember what their names are. I'll look it up. Well, the, I but, believe like, the Texas Rangers were started um, to make sure that after America, like, stole texas from mexico that the they kept they started the rangers to fight anyone coming up from mexico in a rebellion to try to take texas back to quell anything right yeah. right mm-hmm. so that is the myth of the american west i love it it's so good so good it's one of my favorite time periods in american history is just that expansion and how false our perception of it is Mm -hmm. it's just fascinating because when you really like get down when you really drill down and you learn about what happened how the land was taken and how the prospectors came out just kind of like rushed and would stake claims and like what was it like oklahoma and stuff they would rush out and take it and you'd see the natives like in the background going the fuck are these white people doing like right that's my house like what it's like oh no it's not your house anymore because the white people are here. Right. Ding dong. We're here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Not sorry. Oh, that was good. Thank you, Kelly. I really enjoyed that. You're welcome. What is your hey. historical urban legend? Well, mine takes place in in and around London, mostly around London. So London was one of or is one of the biggest cities in Europe. And in the 1830s, there was this fiend who would attack mostly lone women who were out at night and he ended up getting the moniker spring-heeled jack so spring-heeled jack was impossibly tall some reports he was 10 feet tall and he was dressed in white oil cloth like a tight suit of white oil cloth and he was covered with a dark cape and he wore a helmet that obscured his face and possibly made him look taller. 
and he had eyes that were as red as fire and he would run around tearing at women's clothing like their neckline with claws that made of metal and accost them basically oh my god that's so um, freaky isn't that freaky yeah. and um when anybody would come running to help them he would leap all the way to the the rooftops and run away so he was never caught so this the first sighting happened in or the first report i should say happened in 17 i mean 1837 in september and it was in the small town of barnes which is in the outside like the outskirts of london like a suburb so nothing really happened much in the city center but there were reports after it started to become publicized of it happening all over the place so that's what makes it the urban legend is it kind of happens everywhere okay but reports vary so some people say he was really really tall and he was masked some people say white oil cloth some people say he was wearing armor some people say he breathed fire some people say he didn't and i got a lot of the information from a man named michael dash and michael dash lives in europe and he travels to all these places the archives and he reads the first hand reports and he reads second hand reports and he reads old newspaper articles and he writes these amazing essays on all these urban legends that happened in the UK and by far he had the best information on Spring Hill Jack by any means so I got a lot of information from him and um, there are no first-hand reports of Spring Hill Jack jumping anywhere okay but it became part of the legend anytime there's a first-hand report he just runs away <laughs> it just scampers off right so um there are two famous reports of Spring Hill Jack. Uh, the first one happens in February of 1883, and an 18-year-old girl named Jane Alsop hears the bell of their front gate ringing, and it's about 9, 9 p.m. at night, and she and her sister are the only two that are still awake. The rest of the family's asleep, and she's like, okay, that's weird. I wonder who could possibly be calling this late in the evening. So she walks out to the gate, and it's dark, so she can't see very well because her eyes haven't adjusted yet. And there's a very, very tall man standing at the gate claiming to be a police officer and that he needs some sort of light source because they've just caught Spring Hill Jack. Of course, she's heard about this guy because it's been going on for around a year now. So she runs back inside and grabs the man a candle. And she comes out, and as the candle illuminates him, she realizes that he's not a police officer, and then he's dressed really oddly. He's wearing a cape, he has this weird mask on, his eyes are red, and he's dressed in like this weird tight white oilcloth suit, and she's really confused. He grabs a candle from her, and then breathes fire into her face, and then begins to pull at her clothing, trying to rip them off of her. So she begins screaming, like you do when someone's trying to rip your clothing off. Right. And she fights him off and is able to get back to the front door, which is still standing open, but she can't get get him off of her. And her sister comes to her rescue and they beat the man away. She grabs her sister, yanks her inside, and they close the door and the man continues to beat at the door for a while until the whole family's awake. And they're standing at the window looking at this freak who's wearing this weird outfit with glowing red eyes. And they finally decide that they're going to call the police very loudly. So they call the police really loudly. And the guy finally is like, I should probably get the hell out of here. Yeah, because back then when they say call the police, they mean literally you have to scream for the police, right? Because there's no <laughs> telephones. Or well, 1837, like that. there might have been like one of they might have had a phone. I don't know. That's a, that's a good point. It wasn't mentioned. Like, I don't know how they called for the police, um, but they might have just started shouting for someone to go get the constable. Right. So he just takes off. He runs off through a field and no one catches him. So eight days later, another young girl, Lucy Scales, and her sister are walking through an alley in the evening in another suburb nearby, about a mile, a mile away, I think is what it said, when they are both stunned by a bright blue flash of fire. And... They see right before it happened, there's this very tall man standing in a like a shadow and he doesn't do anything to them. He doesn't try to rip their clothing off or anything, but he runs away afterwards. And Lucy's sister, who was standing behind Lucy, said the man had some kind of weird lamp 
attached, like a lantern attached to his chest. And he was wearing a weird mask and he was really tall and he had red eyes. But he didn't attack the girls. He just ran off and breathed fire into their faces. So those two attacks were picked up by the media because they were closer to London than the Barnes attack that happened about six to nine months earlier. And there were a lot of little attacks that happened out in rural areas, but they weren't really publicized because the media wasn't nearby when it happened. But with these more urban attacks, the media starts writing articles about this Spring Hill Jack guy. So with the two, the two attacks, there's like some commonalities. There's definitely the fire, but there's no leaping and there's no grabbing at their, their bodices with metal claws, which sounds terrifying. Totally. Then in 1845, Spring Hill Jack is attached to a murder. Just one murder, only one murder. However, it probably didn't happen. It's probably just part of the legend. So Jack shows up on an island, Jacob Island, where he accosts a young sex worker named Maria Davis. He grabs at her neck, breathes fire into her face, starts scratching her uh, clothes off of her with these claws, and then decides to pick her up and throw her into the water around the island, but she can't swim. And of course, she's probably wearing a zillion clothing, like 400 pounds worth of skirts. So she drowns. So now when Dash did, uh, Michael Dash did his research on this, this supposed murder, there was no Maria Davis living in Jacob Island. There were no death records, no autopsy records. So there was, there probably was no Maria Davis. There probably was no murder like this. So it was most likely a hoax, but it did really frighten people a lot more that now Spring Hill Jack just wasn't sexually assaulting women. He was murdering them as well. And it wasn't until, like, so around around 1900, people largely forgot about Spring Hill Jack until UFOs and our favorite cryptid hunters discovered him again. What's a UFO? So, a UFO enthusiast, unidentified, like, aliens, people who they like had, aliens. They had them in 1900? No, no. So oh, okay. Until, like, in, in the 1960s, they're rediscovered. Oh, 1960s. These guys, okay. Yeah. Yeah, cryptid hunters and UFO enthusiasts rediscover him in the 1960s. So in 1961, in an issue of Flying Saucer Review, (laughs) sounds like awesome reading, Uh uh, a contributor wrote an article attributing the London Spry Phantom to an extraterrestrial visiting our fine land. Then a cryptozoologist named Ken Gerhard has Spring Hill Jack listed as one of the top five flying humanoid cryptoids in his book, Encounters with Flying Humanoids, Mothman, Manbirds, Gargoyles, and Other Winged Beasts. Okay. Also, I'm sure riveting reading. Right, right. I looked. I <laughs> just looked at some pictures on him online, Spring Heel Jack, and sort of so yeah, kind of looks like a, a bat. Batman. He looks like Batman, yeah. like a Batman, early version Batman. of Batman. Yeah. Right, right. So I was like, I was really curious, like, okay, so how? How did he get his name? Like, I get the spring-heeled part. That's pretty easy. Like, he's jumping really high. And there were, I think by the spring of January 1883, news outlets were calling him Spring Jack. And then a few months later, he was spring-heeled Jack. I was like, but why Jack? Right. I couldn't find an answer. So I talked to my husband about it a little bit. He's like, well, how about Jack the Ripper? Right. So I was like, oh, well, cool. I'll look into Jack the Ripper. How'd he get his name? Did you know that Jack the Ripper wrote to the media taunting the police and signed Jack the Ripper at the bottom of the notes. My God, he's like the Zodiac Killer. He is totally like the Zodiac Killer. I was like, he named himself. I was stunned. I had never heard that before. And I've watched so much Jack the Ripper shit. And I don't know if I just zoned out or had drank too much while I was watching it or smoked too much weed, but I did not remember him naming himself. I was blown away. Right. So I don't know why they name him Jack. I have no idea. It's just a common name. Who knows? Maybe there was a lot of douchebags named Jack. I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, maybe after Jack the Ripper, they just thought that any douchebag, they would just call him Jack. Well, Jack the Ripper was later. Unless like Union Jack. I thought Jack the Ripper was in the 1800s. It was the 18s. This was in the 1800s too, but the first 
sighting was in 1883. Oh, when was Jack the Ripper? I'm sorry, 18, 1830s. What? Sorry, 1830s. When was Jack the Ripper? Later? Later? Later. Later 1800s? Later. Yes, later 1800s. I don't know. Maybe because like a Union Jack thing. Maybe like just blokes, young, young yeah, guys. Yeah, it might have just been like a common name too. Right. So it's just like Jack, like John, you know, it's just right. a very common name. Michael, you know. So I was wondering, okay, so let's go ahead and pretend that Spring Hill Jack's a real guy. Okay. Let's go ahead and pretend that it's not just a legend, a ghost story. Let's pretend it's some real guy accosting women. So what's up with him jumping that high? We know people can't jump like 16 feet in the air. It's not possible. So the idea that he had springs in his shoes is probably not what that was all about. So I did a little research on did people actually wear springs in their shoes to try to jump really high? Well, in 1938, the German army experimented with combat boots equipped with springs, hoping that they could leap higher in battle, I guess. And all they got was a bunch of broken ankles. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, unless you're on really flat ground, like, you know, just really even ground, using spring-equipped shoes is probably not wise. And Anytime Spring Hill Jack was seen, it was cobblestones or a country lane or a, a vacant rocky area or open field or a park. So there's nothing flat about it. It's all rocky. So the idea that he's actually using some sort of augmented shoe is probably not going to happen. Not unless he then, had like um, like a, some kind of crutches or something too, you know, like to yeah, keep to him, make him taller, to, right? Well, to keep to him ma- balanced, really. Right. Well, you, I thought still about like, those. It would still like bust an ankle, I would think. He'd roll an ankle pretty good. Oh, yeah. So then I did some more research on, on spring-equipped shoes and came up with satellite shoes in the 1950s, which were remodified and repackaged as moon shoes in the 1990s, which you said you owned a pair of. <laughs> yeah. And they didn't <laughs> – they didn't um, – it was like not as seen on, on TV. No, you were not jumping nearly as high, right? No, I mean you were barely you were so bouncy. It was just bouncy. You were barely even getting off the ground. You may as it was just bouncy. Exactly. So then I thought, well, he seemed to be really, really tall. What if he was wearing some sort of weird, like spring sort of thing? Like they have like people who have lost a leg. They have those cool spring like Yeah, like the runner, like prosthetics. That, like, yeah, like that, those runners. Like that Oscar so. whatever, the guy that killed his girlfriend. But that runner who made it to the Olympics. <laughs> You know yeah, that guy. About? Yeah, that guy. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So then there was this other thing called kangaroo jumps, which are a new shoe that is, uh, they're similar to what you would think these spring things look like. They're similar to what the spring thing looks like that you can run on if you have lost a leg. Right. Um, but they're just, they're on the shoes. And you don't jump very high in those either. So I'm like, okay, so we're going to go ahead and nix the shoe thing. What? What if he was practicing some form of early parkour? parkour. <laughs> yeah. So I just, okay, so parkour, like what's the deal with parkour? So it was invented or developed, I should say. It was developed in France in the 1980s by the Bell family. And it became popular in the 1990s. So I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't track with, you know, age and stuff. Can I go back further? So there was a guy named Georges Herbert who came up with this um, exercise method that incorporated flexibility, strength, and endurance training, and he called it la méthode naturelle. And he started developing this back before World War I when he went to Africa and witnessed the African tribe tribesmen who were very agile and very um, stealthy, and they were able to do all this stuff, like, you know, climb trees and jump from rock to rock without having gone to a gym isn't that quaint right i just thought it was so so patronizing right like oh look they're so fit and they've never gone to a gym or been trained by a white person <laughs> it's like okay right all right dude so that still doesn't track but i was thinking like okay well what if there was some guy who was like an acrobat right they had so them back just, then for sure yeah yeah absolutely so you've just been attacked some guy just grabbed you and started scratching at your your body, trying to get your clothes off of you. He's breathed fire claws. into your face with metal claws. He's breathed fire. How do you into think he's face. breathing fire into their face? Which is like I'm gonna get to that. Okay, I'm gonna get to that. 
So then he's, he's breathed fire into your face. He's grabbing at your clothing. And all of a sudden, he, like, parkours away. Right. You'd think he was flying, of course, right? Like if you've you had, never you've seen anything like never it. Never seen it. Yeah. You're terrified, right? So, of course, you're like, he just jumped into the heavens. Right. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. He flew away. So, I mean, I was like, okay, that kind of tracks. But I was like, okay, what about the fire breathing? So... There are many instances where Spring Hill Jack did not breathe fire, but the two main ones are with Lucy Scales and Jane Alscott, right? They say he breathes fire into their face. Both instances, some sort of lamp or light, fire was present. Right. So when Jane goes to answer the gate, the man demands a candle. Right. She runs back inside, grabs him a candle. He yanks the candle from her hand and then breathes fire into her face. I've been at enough parties with enough douchebags to know that 151 and a tiki torch right. makes a great little blowtorch, right? Right. So she doesn't see him. She's not present with him the whole time. There's no reason to say that if he did breathe fire into her face that he didn't have a little, like, flask flask of liquor on him yeah. and then he breathed you know he used the flame right to breathe the fire so then eight days later he's modified his kit and now is carrying his own flame and right. a lantern attached to his chest where he then breathes fire into these other girls faces i think he was just testing shit out so you know like um this is making me think of scary movie mm. you know like the parody mm-hmm. of all the scary movies. Yeah, so like, yeah. okay, so I'll, I'll whatever, watch his, those. <laughs> whatever his name is, like the one, the killer, the one who like wears the ghost mask, you know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. her name is Cindy. Cindy in the movie is like in, in her classroom in school and she looks outside and he's like standing by a tree and mm-hmm. then she looks away for a second to look back because it's like a scary movie and then he'd be gone. But like what they show you in scary movie is when she looks away, he like quick turns around and like quick runs like behind a tree, you know, and it's <laughs> right, right. Like he's just kind of like hiding really quickly. Yeah, it's like it's not like... at all smooth. And it like he looks all silly because he like quick turns and like runs real quick to like get behind a tree, you know, and yeah. Well, when I was I was reading the reports of, of, of the two, the two girls who were attacked, um, he just runs off through a field. Right. And I'm trying to imagine like somebody gracefully running through a field, and I can't do it because they're rocky, they're uneven ground, there's potholes and like he's probably overholes. falling a couple times. He's and he's got his cape like flapping out in the background. He's just right. it's ridiculous right. to me. Right. Right. So. So what do you think about the the his glowing red glowing eyes? I think it was part of the mask. Okay. I think it was just part of the mask that he was wearing. Okay. And I think the mask made him look taller. I think it probably was like more like a headdress. Right. Kind of a thing. So. He should be in an asylum. What a sick. I know, right? Yeah. What a total freak. So the belief in spring heeled Jack obviously doesn't really track today. Like people are like, whatever. That's I worry more about being mugged by knife point than some creep breathing fire. Right. But even during the time that the reports were being placed, people, like a lot of people thought that, like the public thought that Spring Hill Jack was a demon, like some kind of ghost, because ghost stories were really prominent in London at the time. I feel like so was like there, hysteria. You know what I mean? Like yes, people were yes. a little hysterical about things like this. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea that um, he was some sort of, you know, specter. Nobody believed that, especially the police. They're like, you know what we really think? We think that spring Hill Jack is probably real and that his exploits have been greatly exaggerated. Right. But we don't, we don't think it's just one guy. We think it's probably a bunch of rich, white douche nozzles. Oh, of course. And they're bored. Yeah. And they're yeah. just accosting women because they can afford all this crazy tech. And they're and bored. they're just they're, dickheads. Yeah. Right, they're bored. They're so, probably like addicted to opium and cocaine and alcohol, and and they're probably like sickos. I don't think you said you watched it, American Horror Story. No, I can't watch those things. But did you, but did you watch any of them? I tried to watch the first season. Okay, so the first season, which is the only season I've seen, like the doctor who used to own the house, who was performing abortions in the basement, he was addicted to like um, ether. Oh, right. So he would like just huff on ether and he was like really fucked up in the head. Well, yeah, I mean, anytime you're like 
you know, augmenting your reality, especially with something that deprives your brain of oxygen. Right. You're going to be a little fucked up. Right. And if you already have a propensity to be violent, oh boy. Right. Yay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> so popular media. After the initial attacks in 1838, Jack quickly became, um, made his way into several penny dreadfuls. And I was like, what's a penny dreadful? It's like a little play, but actually it's like Pulp Fiction novels, like cheap right. short stories. Yeah. Um, where he appeared either as a demon or a jilted outlaw. So these stories helped solidify Jack, at least temporarily, into Britain's consciousness. And soon parents were telling unruly children, if you don't behave, Spring Hill Jack will come and get you. Of course. And um, any mysterious crime that couldn't be, like, couldn't be pinned on somebody was the handiwork of Spring Hill Jack. Yeah. So there you go. There's Spring Hill Jack. All right. Well, interesting. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Well, this is Demi World. Yeah. And this is Cindy. And this is Kelly. <laughs> and this is, again, Demi World. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, okay, bye. Bye. This has been Demi World. You can follow us on Facebook at Demi World Podcast and Twitter at Demi World Cast. You can write us at Demi World Podcast at Gmail. You can find the cast anywhere podcasts live or at our website, demiworld.net. And remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for listening.